On the Spot with Michelle McCory is brought to you by Prime XBT. Is the Fed actually getting inflation under control? Inflation fell in May to around half of last year's peak, but is still double the Fed's target. The consumer price index rose 4% last month from a year earlier, well below the recent peak of 9.1% last June and down from April's 4.9% increase. It's the 11th consecutive month that inflation has slowed, but it doesn't really feel like inflation has cooled when paying your bills. So is CPI really an accurate reflection of the rising cost of living for Americans? My next guest says that there is increasing evidence to support the suspicion that CPI does not represent the actual inflation that Americans face as they struggle with rising prices for everything they use. But how much does it really matter given that CPI and core CPI is the data that the Fed uses to make its decisions anyway? So what can we expect from the Fed? And more importantly, what can investors do about it? Joining me to discuss this and more is Michael Wilkerson. He is the CEO and founder of Stormwall Advisors, a strategic and financial advisory firm. He's also the host of Stormwall.com and author of Why America Matters, The Case for a New Exceptionalism. Michael has over two decades of experience in finance and consulting, including as a managing director at Lazard. And he is also the chairman of Charity Water, an NGO which seeks to solve the global water crisis. Michael, very good to have you with us. Welcome back to Kitco. Michelle, great to see you. All right, lots to cover. Let's start off, though, with the CPI number that we got. The index increasing just 0.1% for the month and 4% from a year ago, the lowest level in about two years. And excluding food and energy, core CPI rising 0.4% for the month, 5.3% for the year. Now, before we get into your argument that it isn't really an accurate inflection anyway, what is your read on the data that we do have? Well, it strikes me a couple of things, Michelle. First of all, it was close to market's expectations, which were 4.1 for the month. They're also suggesting that June will come down to 3.2. So there is this expectation of diminishing uh, inflation. However, when you look at what's under the numbers, what you see is this is all being driven by energy, in particular by decline in oil and gas prices. So down uh, 20% for gasoline, down 37% for fuel oils. That's really pushing the overall number down. Core CPI, as you mentioned, uh, is actually still quite elevated. So shelter, food, transportation, three big drivers, all of them still up high single digits. Uh, in the case of transportation, up, up over 10%. When you look at the aggregate of what consumers are experiencing, uh, things aren't better. Uh, and in fact, shelter in particular, housing, whether purchased homes or rentals, um, transportation, and in particular, even electricity power to the home is up some five and a half percent. And let's keep in mind, this is the second year of running inflation. So what does that mean? We've got the base effects, the compounding effects of a couple of years. So in terms of consumers' pocketbooks, it's actually quite difficult out there. Yeah, it, it certainly does feel that way. I want to break down your argument more that uh, even the CPI data as it currently is, even with the factors that you just listed, isn't necessarily an accurate reflection anyway. But before we get to that, uh, I do want to talk about what we can expect from the Fed because markets are now pricing in practically a 100% chance that the Fed is not going to raise rates this week, even as Fed Chair Jerome Powell maintains that he is going to keep at it until the job is done and that inflation is back down to 2%. So what are you expecting? I think there's a lot of reason to believe in a pause, whether this is the last uh, or last month was the last hike of the year, I don't know. But I do think that at the moment that the weight of decision making leads us to think that there will be a pause this month. I would be quite surprised to see another rate hike, as with the market, as you pointed out, the expectation is basically uh, no action. And I think that's reasonable as we absorb what's going to happen in the next couple of months. Now, you did mention that uh, inflation still remains, the headline CPI, more than two times the Fed's expectation. So at some point, the Fed is going to have to find a way to get back down to, to ground level. I don't think they have a lot of tools to do that. We can get into this later, but issues around the fact that uh, you know the Treasury has got to find a, around a trillion, trillion dollars of liquidity 
in the coming months. And there's other issues that have to happen. Uh, so I don't think they're going to be able to continue to raise rates in that environment. All right. Yeah, we will unpack that later. And as you quite rightly point out, we do have the Treasury now needing to fill up its uh, piggy bank, if you will, the Treasury general account. And that means flooding the markets with about a trillion dollars worth of debt over the next few months, which is going to have a further tightening effect. Again, before we get to that, I do want to get your thoughts on what it would mean if there is a pause this month, because former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers, who quite rightly warned that we would see inflation a few years back when we saw that unprecedented fiscal and and monetary stimulus, he said that the Fed should consider a major rate hike in July if it pauses this month, meaning he's saying that we should probably see a raise of 50 basis points in July if there's a pause and if the economy continues hot and if inflation figures are robust, depending on his interpretation of robust. Now, Elon Musk tweeted in response to that, saying that that would be insane to have a 50 basis point hike in July. What's your read? Do you see that happening? Well, I tend to lean to the that sounds insane to me side of the argument only because we've already seen signs that the very rapid increase in interest rates, raising of rates over the past year, almost broke the banking system. Uh, you can get to a destination, but if you drive there too too fast, too aggressively, uh, you're putting yourself and others at risk. And in this case, the Fed, I believe, will be doing great damage to the economy, probably more damage than what might be worth uh, in the near term uh, for the incremental benefit in the inflation fight. I do think they have to keep fighting. I think that rates are the, way, uh, the tool that they have at hand to do it, but I think we would be uh, risking a, a relapse in terms of some of the dangers that we saw in March and April around our big banks. Right. We did have, what, three of the four largest banking collapse in U.S. history happening this year alone in the face of an aggressive Fed. Let's touch on this idea very quickly then of the Treasury, which may, uh, well, not may, does need to refill its account, does need to issue a ton of debt. Many are seeing that as an extra tightening effect on the market on the economy at large, sucking up a lot of liquidity. Does that mean that that the Fed needs to back off? Or can we see a situation where we have double the liquidity being drained with the Fed raising rates, the Fed continuing to run off its balance sheet, and the Treasury selling uh, debt to, to raise its coffers up? Well, what's interesting is you look at what's happened in the bond market. So since the debt ceiling deal, deal was reached at the beginning of the month, over the past couple of, of weeks, bond prices have fallen, yields have risen, risen I believe, uh, in the two-year around 35 basis points. The, the Treasury is going to have to, is going to go to market in these big pieces. Yields are likely to continue to rise. This is actually bad for the banking system because, again, one of the tensions that exists right now that, that precipitated the crisis is, uh, investors, depositors, people like you and me uh, are leaving the banking system in droves where they're still paying in savings accounts, 25, 50 basis points and CDs 1%. And I can walk across the street metaphorically and buy these new treasuries at four, four and a half, five percent 5% for some of the shorter dates. That is going to put continue to put pressure, I think, on the banking system. At some point, though, the question is going to be, is there a, a trillion dollars of domestic demand? Because what we do also know is that foreigners aren't really picking up these bonds the way they used to in the past. So if we had a situation where the, the domestic market starts to run out of capacity to absorb it or loses interest, they're either going to have to uh, continue to rate it to, to, to offer better yields, uh, or we may see an end of the shrinking of the Fed's balance sheet and reversal of, of, QT, of QT back to back to QE, or at least a stabilization of the reduction uh, in, in the Fed's balance sheet. So what would that mean? Well, it would mean if we got in a situation where there was not enough demand elsewhere and we find that the Fed is now monetizing the debt, going back to a, an environment where it is buying uh, either directly from the tre treasury or through the banking system, uh, these same treasury bonds and bills. But what would that mean for the Fed's fight against inflation then? I, it would undermine it. It would absolutely undermine it. Right, which is... Probably going to get us to a point I want to make referencing your previous interview where you said we can expect inflation to be much, much higher this year. But before we get to that, I do want to touch on this idea that the CPI print is not really an accurate 
reflection of what is happening. This, as I mentioned, is the 11th consecutive month that inflation has slowed. Uh, this time last year, the CPI, CPI print rather was more than double at 8.6%. But, you know, it doesn't really feel like inflation has cooled on a consumer basis. Granted, the price of eggs has gone down quite a bit. I'm relieved about that. I do eat a lot of eggs. Uh, but overall, one certainly continues to feel the pinch across the board. And there has been an ongoing controversy about whether the CPI is, in fact, an appropriate proxy for inflation over the years. The methodology used to calculate the CPI has undergone numerous revisions. Uh, some critics say that those changes are perhaps a purposeful manipulation that allowed the U.S. government to report a lower CPI. Now, you recently wrote an article showing a big disconnect between the CPI and what families are experiencing on a daily basis from data from the private sector. Break that down for us. Yeah, so I think, as you know, I and Stormwell Advisors have been doing a lot of work this year around what's really going on with inflation. This has become one of the key themes because it's, it's affecting everything. It's affecting business, it's affecting households, consumers. And there, there has been this sense of this disconnect between what uh, consumers' businesses are actually experiencing and what the data represent. So in the beginning of the year, I started to unpack some of this sector by sector. So looking at food, looking at electricity, power to the home, and then eventually looking across a number of other sectors. Education, how much does it cost to send your daughter to college? Cost of medical care, uh, the cost of housing, whether it be in rents or, or, or to own food at home across a number of categories, looking, as you mentioned, at private sector data. And listen, you could argue that this is still, even, even by doing this kind of research, it's still relatively anecdotal. You're getting it from one source, et cetera. Well, I think it's re more representative of what's actually happening. When you look across these industry silos, what you see in, in each of these sectors that I've mentioned, time and time again, those private sector sources of data, and even my own data, uh, from purchase experiences that is easily trackable in this day and age, what generally, if I generalize, inflation is running two to three times what the CPI data are showing in those key categories, in uh, food, in electricity, in education, higher education specifically, in medical care, et cetera. I don't think it's uh, a coincidence. I don't think it's an accident. I think the revisions and changes to CPI are an attempt to moderate the information that is being shared uh, and to try in a way to gaslight the American consumer to contradict their own experience and what they are actually having to live with and deal with. And by the way, you see it from the other side of the angle in terms of uh, increase in uh, credit card usage, debt consumer debt balances, uh, shrinking of savings accounts, all the things that are showing on the other side. And I should also mention that even if you do stick with CPI, and that related data, what you're seeing is that real weekly wages are going down. Uh, the consumers are not keeping up, even though nominal wages are up, let's say 6% uh, in the past few months uh, against what peak inflation of 9%. Nonetheless, that's not real. When you look at the real uh, income growth, uh, it's hovering around zero or negative. So no, I don't believe the CPI data accurately reflects uh, the environment in which we find ourselves and doesn't reflect the experience that businesses, consumers, households are undergoing in this environment. Now, I know you have extensive notes on this on stormwalladvisors.com where you really break down the categories, but let's just run through one or two of them for our viewers. For instance, you note that CPI suggests that healthcare costs have risen by about 2.6% year over year over the last decade, Whereas analysis by PwC shows that medical care costs have actually risen by a staggering 220% since 2006, and that's an annual average rise of 7.6%. Uh, break, break some more of those details down for us in the other categories, like you mentioned, like education, like electricity, if you have any of those examples to pull up for us. And, and, and so, by the way, so what I'll mention there is that in medical care, the figures you just quoted, the, that private sector data- I'm quoting your figures. <laughs> I, sorry, yes. Yeah, um, represents three times what CPI is, sh is showing for the same category for medical care over roughly the same period. There's a couple years discrepancy, but it's, it's not significant. 
look at it across a higher higher education. So again, a CPI data for the I think it's a, um, for the past ten years shows annual inflation at two point four percent. But when you look at the private sector data, the cost of whether it be public, private, or overall, uh, the inflation is four point one percent. Okay, annually over that same period of time, roughly double. And in fact, a separate private research from the Brookings Institution, their institute on uh, on on higher education, educational policy, shows that in the last two years, the educational inflation has been up five and a half, five point three, eight point five percent in a year where it's showing again, you know, somewhere around a third of that, according to the official uh, the official CPI data. You can replicate this across. Uh, food, where I don't have this data in front of me. I wrote about this back in February uh, at a time when I believe the CPI food at home data was around 8% in terms of inflation, somewhere between 8 and 10% during those for the first quarter. And that uh, what you were seeing from a number of other factors, if you just looked at the key categories of things that people actually buy, uh, that you had a number that was high teens, almost double that again, uh, looking at historical data. One of the, I, I'm an addict of Amazon Prime. I use Amazon Prime for 90%, especially of, of, of food, other than other produce, et cetera. And fortunately, I was able to go back and look really over the years of Amazon data across same items in the same categories, adjusting for things like packaging and all that sort of thing. And time and time again, I was shocked at the increases. I mean, we're talking about 30% uh, over three years. Let's set, let's, you know, I used a couple different benchmarks, but starting from the uh, year zero pandemic year 2020 January and then looking forward over three years seeing 30 40 percent total increases ie somewhere between 10 11 uh, even as high as 14 15 percent annual increases over this past year uh, anecdotes like that where you see it and again sorry just one last that I might make is just electricity where I mentioned that CPI right now is showing 5.6 percent it completely underrepresents what is actually happening. So in the last couple of years, we've seen even C CPIU does show somewhere around 14, 16% inflation uh, in electricity. But if you look at price increases, go to the regulatory data or even just what the regulators have said, sorry, the power companies have said, um, they are budgeting this year increases of 15, 20, 25% because you know, those price increases lag because it is a regula regulated environment. They have to go through a process. So we're seeing catch up now, and we're going to see, in my view, that uh, electricity inflation is going to continue to rise at double digit paces uh, here for my home uh, power company, uh, for business, corporate, and residential consumers. Prices are up substantially, again, in that sort of 20% zip code from just a year ago. Yeah, I mean, my... Uh... Con Ed bill has practically doubled. Granted, my use of electricity perhaps has increased as well, but not, not by uh, as much as the, the bill would indicate. I'm also a big fan of Amazon Prime, by the way. Um, Mike, and, and you can, you can actually see the differences between uh, goods that you order regularly, and it's a lot more than, than 4%. So the question is, is this done by design? I mean, do you think that the Bureau of Labor Statistics is intentionally understating true inflation? And if so, with what goal? I will say there are a lot of incentives. One is that, of course, people are very concerned when they realize their purchasing power is diminished. Michelle, if you go back just using CPI and you started at the beginning of the century, just 20 years ago, you and I, every person living in this country using dollars, actually anybody who uses a dollar anywhere in the world, your purchasing power has gone down by 40%, all right? If we see another year of inflation uh, where I expect it to be, which as I said, uh, last time I was with you, I said 8, 10, 12%. If you keep up another year or two, the, the value of the dollar will have been cut in half in a quarter of a century. That's just on the CPI data, accepting it as it is. If that actually is understating it, then you see that uh, we are being robbed. Inflation is a hidden tax. The, the incentives lie with governments to inflate away the problem of debt and deficits. We've got $21 trillion of accumulated deficit since 2001, the last time we ran a surplus. The debt ceiling deal just kicks the can down the road and effectively allows government to continue to run this mass, massive trillion dollar deficits uh, at least into 2025. 
and they need to keep it a secret. They need to keep the lid on the on what's actually happening, which is taxation by misrepresentation of the reality of inflation as a slow leak out of the bottom uh, of the boat. I think uh, that secret is out of the bag now, Mike. I think people are starting to catch on to this. You, you mentioned your forecast that you made on this show in February, where you suggested that inflation could climb to between 8 and 12 percent by the end of this year, by the beginning of 2024. Uh, due primarily to monetary stimulus and uh, I guess what you're saying, the diminishing purchasing power of the dollar. Are, are you still holding onto that forecast, 8 to 12% by 2024? And if so, explain how and why. So first of all, I am, yes. The odds may have shifted towards the downside a bit. I don't remember whether I said at the time of our last uh, uh, time we were together, the, the the curve, how you know how and when and how it would shape up. But what I know I've said elsewhere publicly is that I did think that it was likely that inflation would continue to come down through the summer. And by the way, I've, I'm sticking with that. So I don't think I think June June and July are likely to continue down, and that it would begin to increase in the fall. There are two things in my mind that are that would drive a rebound in inflation. One is monetary. One is this continued uh, printing press that we're seeing. And again, I just mentioned the debt deal and the fact that we are going to continue to drive into further deficits. We've talked about some of the uh, issues around uh, the bond market, around banks. All of those things could create uh, further QE type of pressures. We have seen uh, the money supply, M2 money supply, come down over uh, the past six months. But we have to keep in mind the starting point for the global financial crisis was that the money supply, M2, has tripled from 2007 until last year. So the fact that it's coming down five or even 10% off of those highs really doesn't address the underlying monetary issue. So that's one thing. And that is my core thesis that this inflation is a monetary inflation. And as such, it will persist until uh, price inflation has caught up with the money supply. The other issue is more uh, supply demand. And that is, um, I mentioned, or we mentioned at the beginning of this around CPI that in May, the real driver of the decline, and it's true in April as well, is the decline in energy prices, specifically gas and oil. Uh, I am not of the view that where we are right now, which is uh, WTI and Brent off 30% off of, the, off of the beginning of the year, trading around $69, $73 each uh, as of today, that those are sustainable levels. I do think that we're likely to see price movements back up towards where it was at the beginning of the year. Um, one of the drivers of that is simply the ability of BRICS Plus, which is not in a mood to be friendly, to continue to, even in the face of recession or weak demand, to make decisions that are in their interest and not in ours. And what does that mean? Their, what are their incentives? What are their interests? Well, the Sa- Saudis just last week said, uh, basically half-jokingly, um, to the t- oil traders, be careful. Uh, we see that uh, oil is going to go back up to 80, 90, even $100 by the end of the year. So translating it transparently that this was this was their view, the market dismissed it. Uh, nothing's really happened in the last few days. We've seen a little bit of upward movement in, in, in price. But I think that because, just, as, just as it has been the main factor in reducing nominal CPI, headline CPI, I believe that it could be the driving factor in the fall in turning CPI around. The monetary issue, number one, that's a long-term phenomenon. It could be that we see that you know nothing happens for a long time and suddenly something happens. I think this uh, oil market issue, the, 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 which drives everything. In turn, the derivative of that is, does China get moving again? Is it going to open up or not? It's showing a lot of weakness right now uh, and deflationary pressures even. So I think that's the chain of events. The either demand picks up from China or a BRICS plus, OPEC plus, or whatever the right phrase here, OPEC plus in this context, decides that uh, they want to maintain price stability, not of the dollar, but price stability of oil and uh, and want to tighten the market. All right, let's talk about that a little bit more. As you quite rightly point out, uh, much of the decline in CPI this month was driven by energy prices falling 11.7% over the year. And as you said, the Saudis are making it quite clear that uh, they're going to cut oil production. They are, of course, the largest oil producers in OPEC, and they said that they're going to cut oil by 1 million barrels of oil per day. 
Um, and other OPEC members have also promised to cut oil production into 2024. And of course, OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, accounts for 40 percent of the world's crude oil production. And as much as uh, people may want to move away from oil, we're still very, very much dependent on it. Um, meanwhile, we have the U.S. now starting to refill the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, purchasing over 3 million barrels of oil. They shouldn't have arguably tapped into it in the first place, considering it's for emergencies, but they have been using it to fight inflation. And the SPR has fallen from 511 million to around 355 million barrels of oil over the course of a year. So we expect them to have to fill up the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. As you mentioned, uh, China could jump into the market. Yeah, it has uh, some issues with its own economy, but it looks like uh, it may still be a long-term oil buyer. So how do you see this playing out then? You said you see inflation still hitting that target of between, and I get it, it's a range, but between 8 and 12% end of 2023, end of Q1 of 2024. Elaborate a little bit more on how this oil dynamic plays out. Because oil feeds everything. So oil prices go into food prices. Sorry, it goes into energy. Because don't, you know, let, let us not forget that it still drives um, electricity production power home in a lot of markets. Diesel represents, well, in the food industry, 7% of all food in the U.S. is carried by trucks. The vast majority, 99% of, of long-haul trucks run on diesel. Trains run on diesel. Ships and planes run on diesel. So, so those transportation costs. Everything, with a few exceptions, everything is a derivative of the energy market. And right now, the energy market is still uh, an, an oil and gas market. So it, the link is direct. You know, you mentioned the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, and we we're playing a very very reckless game here. Uh, the Petroleum Reserve, the Strategic Reserve, was full uh, at the beginning of two thousand one at the tra at the transition of administration. It was slowly and secretly drained, or released without fanfare. You mean twenty twenty one? In twenty twenty one, excuse me. Yeah, uh, it was full. And now it is, at, I believe, at less than half. It's getting near the border where it would be illegal for them to drain anymore based on the original authorization. The average cost was the equivalent of, in, in gas prices get, get per gallon of gas, less than $2. And we are refilling it now, but at about uh, two times that cost. And 3 million barrels is nothing. It's a drop in the bucket. They were draining 30 million barrels a day excuse me, a, a month, four months on end. So this is a very dangerous thing. This was something that was supposed to be a strategic asset for the national defense, and it was turned into a political tool, which is the, a tool to uh, impact prices at the pump. And of course, then uh, midterm elections and, and, and all of that sort of thing. We did that very rec recklessly in the sense that if we actually, if there were a true strategic emergency, uh, we would have been in a bad way just as we are verging on being in a bad way in terms of our overall military armaments due to the depletion uh, from the hostilities in Ukraine. So last time we spoke, Michael, you said, therefore, you are very bullish on oil and oil companies. Do you still hold that position safe to assume? I do. Now, of course, as I mentioned, we've been in a bit of a bear market in, in the last uh, little bit in, in oil and gas. Look at what's happened in the markets. It's been uh, unbelievable. The bond markets and the equity markets are not talking to each other. The bond markets are continuing to signal uh, recession. We saw that the uh, eurozone just went into recession with two quarters of negative GDP. We're not there yet. The U.S. had real GDP of 1.2, 1.3% in the first quarter. But the bond, uh, the yields are inverted. Uh, the, yield, the yield curve is inverted. The, the best, historically best signal of recession. And on the other hand, the equity markets are flying. So the fangs are up some 77% year to date, semiconductors up probably 43, 44%, S&P 14%. Why? Well, I don't know. Uh, you know the, the, the fangs and semiconductors, this is the AI, the AI bubble. AI is a very real thing. It is going to be transformational. It is the most, one of the most important things that we need to be paying attention to, attention to right now. But the equity markets were in, of course, the typical kind of euphoria that it accompanies a real underlying phenomena, as we saw with uh, the internet, as we saw 
with telecoms, et cetera, et cetera, automobiles, railroads. So that's fine. That's what's happening. I think that I am not really comfortable, however, with should have, should have been there, uh, three months ago, of course, but I don't know that now is an entry point. And so I come back you know, to the question you're asking. I look at that. I look at where we've had a really good rally uh, so far this year. The broader market is now trading back above 30 times price to earnings on a you know, case shiller basis. That's high. That's expensive. And uh, by nature, I, I pivot towards value. And I think in an environment like this where cash is no longer free, Dividends and value plays actually are worth something. They, they you could we could have made the argument in any zero interest rate environment that no one cared about dividends. Well, they didn't. That's that, that's a fact. But, um, but but they underperformed. Value underperformed for that reason because people didn't really care about dividends. They get money uh, liquidity from anywhere. I think in this environment, money is more expensive by historical standards. Not ridiculously expensive, but you know if the risk free rate is call it four and a half five percent. Uh, you have to think about it. And so I tilt back to value. I tilt back to dividends. Yes, then I tilt back for the reasons that I've, we've just discussed around where I think the oil and gas markets are likely to go. As a long-term play, I, I still am, am favorable. Are we out of the oil bear market? I don't know. I gave a, a, a case of how we could be, but it, it may not be the case. Nonetheless, uh, I like the fact that I think we're at the low end of a probable range in terms of oil prices. I like the fact that the pressure uh, around ESG is coming up somewhat, not not completely, but there. But I think you're hearing CEOs take more aggressive stances, tell the truth, and say we, this is not this sort of uh, zero carbon environment is not possible in the near term. We're going to need oil and gas for a long time. Prices are such that the yields aren't as attractive as they were, but nonetheless, I think it's a it's a reasonably safe harbor in an environment where other things look uh, potentially overpriced. Do you have any particular picks then in the sector? Well, and I can't remember what I said last time, but I continue to be a big fan of of Exxon, of, Phil, of Phillips, of uh, Chesapeake, others uh, in the sector. And as I mentioned before, uh, I still like the miners. And I know that sounds antiquated, but I look- The gold miners, gold and silver miners. Gold miners and even you know the broader names like Rio Valley, but, but certainly Newmont, others, just because- um, I think that you're going to see, again, you have very attractive dividends in the case of stuff. some of those names, double digit uh, yields at this point. And, and I think for reasons that I know you and this program talk about a lot, uh, gold is on the come. Now, is it always on the come? How long do we have to wait to see what's going to happen? I'm okay to wait. Uh, in the meantime, for the miners, especially, uh, you get the dividend along the way. Okay, of course our viewers want to hear your thoughts on gold. We'll save that till the end because you did mention uh, the recession in Europe and quite right, uh, two quarters of negative GDP in the EU. You know, there's the expression that if China sneezes, the US catches a cold. I guess my question is, if Europe sneezes, is it possible that the US catches a cold? What's your quick outlook on a recession going into uh, the second half of the year? I'm less focused on the contagion aspect of whether Europe can push the U.S. into recession. I think we've seen a, analogous situations before where, where the economy in Europe has been quite weak and the U.S. has been able to tick along just fine. I don't see a reason why that isn't true today. In fact, really what's happened in Europe, you know, they're running, by the way, the numbers I gave, that, those negative numbers, that's nominal GDP. Their real GDP uh, is actually going to be much worse. If you look at the inflation that they're facing, it's worse than it is here uh, in the U.S., again, driven by energy, again, driven by the conflict in in Ukraine, uh, an issue where, for better or worse, the U.S. is benefiting from it. Our energy industries are benefiting from replacing Russian uh, gas. Our industries are benefiting, our defense industries, from uh, feeding uh, feeding the beast. And so I, I think that I'm not as worried about it as much as I am suggesting. I think one of the things that struck me is how little attention there's be, that is being paid to the, to the reality that Europe, the European area is already technically in a recession, that the economy is weakening. And I see similar trends here. I mentioned this you know, disconnect between what the bond market appears to be saying and what the equity market appears to be saying. There's an awful lot of optimism that remains uh, in the face of some 
uh, evidence that things aren't great. I mean, look at what is happening. Uh, let's take corporate profits down two, two quarters in a row, down 5%. Margins, profit margins are holding up, by the way, they're near all-time highs. They're coming down, but they're still at such large levels. The reason for that is I think, one, they're navigating uh, price inflation, but more importantly is they're squeezing the employees. So you look at compensation, labor share of, of profit uh, of these corporations, and it's, it's quite low by historical standards. So uh, at, at some point, I think we're going to see a shift to labor, and then I think we're going to see profit margins coming down even further. You know, I mentioned that real wages are actually down, labor productivity is down, weekly take home, real real take home is down. What does all of that mean? All of all of that means that the the consumer, which still represents what is it, seventy or so percent of the economy, is not in a great place. Top one percent, the top ten percent, perhaps, but people are, are already maxed out on credit cards, already have already depleted savings, or deferring, and this is all in data. De deferring uh, home purchase decisions, deferring auto purchase decisions, um, and so and there and you look at even confidence expectations uh, are low. They've been uh, using the conference board's data. Consumer confidence expectations have been below eighty percent for about I guess five or six months. Eighty is the sort of line where you draw the low, which is uh, inflation. Excuse me, recession is likely. They view uh, you know we, we've talked about my views on on inflation consumers are anticipating next year six percent so they're somewhere between where we are right now and consumers are anticipating six percent inflation next year according to the consumer board yeah uh, the that's right the the conference board the confidence board rather yeah C a conference board so when you look at where do you think inflation rates will be one year from now uh it still is around six percent interesting uh, yeah, well, one would argue that, you know, perhaps a 4% is going to be the new normal that we have to live with. Uh, of course, Michael, we need to get your thoughts on where you see gold, because gold has been trading below the critical level of 2000 for some time. Got there, but hasn't been able to stay above 2000. What do you think is uh, going to move gold higher and by when? Yeah, so you know, we saw a little bit of it uh, in the banking crisis. We saw both gold and when I say the banking crisis, I, I guess the March phase of it. I, I don't necessarily believe that it's over, but during you know those panic moments, you saw safe haven buys in gold. You saw it in crypto. You saw it elsewhere. Um, it's eased off, and I think again, it goes back to right now. There are some interesting alternatives. Um, you know, the dollar is not showing the strength that I, if you look back at 2022. It feels like there's a very there was a strong correlation between a rising and strong dollar, and a, a as a constraint on, on the gold price in dollar in dollar terms. That isn't really there anymore. You've got all of these things that we've been talking about: the banking crisis, uh, inflation, and recession. So it, it does appear that the stars are aligning for gold. Now the perennial frustration is: okay, the stars have aligned before, and sometimes it doesn't happen. But from my perspective, and we talked about it in the context of miners, I feel comfortable with gold, very comfortable with gold, very comfortable with the miners. And uh, I've stopped looking at my watch, in other words, to ask when. I'm just uh, sticking with the conviction over the long run and something that, uh, that I believe will perform. Okay. Uh, much like many other guests on the show, but I'm going to have to hold you to some kind of price target. Do you see gold making a real all-time high uh, by the end of 2023. It did a break uh, its all-time high on the comics futures, but do you see a real sustained all-time high by the end of 2023? So let's take my answer here in the context of everything else I've said uh, on the show today, which is I think the summer is going to be somewhat boring. I think it's going to be somewhat boring as inflation. I think it's going to be somewhat boring. You know, We're not going to see a lot of news. I did paint a scenario where we could see uh, sort of chapter three of this season's episodes, episode three of this season's uh, banking crisis, uh, and if we get you know further liquidity squeeze from from treasuries, that you know that could put us in a bad place. But otherwise, I think the summer's going to be boring. And uh, if it's boring for inflation and it's boring for banking crises and other geopolitical crises, it may very well be boring for gold. But if you stick with my uh, the hypothesis or the conjecture, maybe nothing more than that, that 
we're going to see or you know, see, see some movement in energy, see some movement in inflation beginning in the fall, then yes, I think there's a plausible scenario that we could see gold back above uh, the 2000 level by the end of the year. I don't see a massive uh, you know, 15, 20% breakout, but I can see a 10% breakout, uh, which of course would be wonderful and we'd all welcome it. Yes, except for, as you say, the conditions that could force gold to go higher, significantly higher, are not always necessarily good for the world or the economy at large, but that's why you have that hedge. Well, Michael, you have been anything but boring, so thank you so much for joining us again. Michael Wilkerson, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, as always, a special thank you to our sponsors, Prime XBT. And there is a special offer for Kitco viewers in our description for Prime XBT, so make sure to check that out. Thank you for checking out On The Spot. I'm Michelle McCory for me and the rest of the team. We'll see you next time. Begin your path to financial freedom. Gain up to a $7,000 bonus on us. Register and use promo code. Deposit and enjoy a 7% bonus. Available now. Link in the description.